Hello, hello, hello. Good afternoon, good evening, good morning. We have uh, another world, Una Day. This is the Mohammed Shilon coming to Una from North Carolina. Um, my co host, my usual co host, Mr. Um, Victor Mengot, not there today, but we do have a distinguished guest. We will, we will introduce himself. Well, Mr. Mengot is not going to be participating in the broadcasting today. Now, of course, you know, no say we'll get with general rules. So let me just announce the numbers. Then we we'll normally people can call in for talk to we in case they get comments uh, or they want for putting a call. You know, from North America, and always I can remind people. We get a toll-free number for North America, but for North America, the toll-free is, and toll-free North America is only restricted to Canada, Mexico, and the US. So this toll-free can work for them three countries and beyond that, if you call from Freetown or any other part or from Europe, um, the toll-free will not work, you will be charged. But the number is 1-866-944-7722. 1-866-944-7722. Now, if you do call from the UK, UK self get a local number, where I don't think for the entire UK, but from London and some other surrounding uh, areas or counties, um, London, you can call from plus 44-2080-9889, I'm sorry, 1455. Plus 44-2080-891455. If you're calling from Australia, likewise, we get a similar situation. We, from the capital, or from Sydney, I believe, Sydney, Australia, you can call the local number of plus 61 2909 Plus 61 if you want for call on WhatsApp, regardless of wherever you are in the world, you will call 1-343-997-5828. 1-343-997-5828. We also get a radio station where you may be able for catch way, in, but it's restricted only to part of Freetown, not the entire Freetown. And that are 91.9 FM. 91.9 FM. So if you want for listen to we on the radio, you have one for there in the eastern part of Freetown. If you tune in 91.9, you may be able to get we. So the other thing is, then the carry, this broadcast is being carried on Facebook, YouTube, you know, and all the, and WhatsApp and the rest of them. So please welcome to send in written commentary. Instagram also we are carried on Instagram. So you're free to send commentaries them. Now any one of them, medium them there. All right. So without much ado, we get a distinguished professor, emeritus, meaning someone who is in retirement, but in last job, active job was that of a professor. So he will introduce himself and give us some of his background. But he's a very accomplished person uh, the, by the name of Professor Jimmy Kande. And uh, he's played a very important, significant role, both in academia and of late, trying to see what the country can benefit from in talent and knowledge. So we get some questions then, knowing that we country, they're at a stage now where the major political parties uh, at an impasse, or they know uh, it's, here, it's neither here nor there. So we don't ask the distinguished professor for please come on the show today and try for enlightening way a little bit. Without much ado, let me turn it over to Professor Jimmy Kande. Let me tell you now, I'll tell we a little bit about himself. So Professor, over to you, sir. Thank you very much, Mr. Shilling. Uh, as una already hearing, my name is Jimmy Kande. I'm a Sierra Leonean. I have born 
Uh, Salon, I left this country way at 22 years old for go do my PhD at the University of Wisconsin, Madison. After I done uh, Madison, I teach in America, mainly University of Richmond, uh, Virginia, for about 30 years or so. But I decided to retire early because I want to come home and try to share the little knowledge where I don't accumulate over the years with me people there. Because one thing about being an academic, where some man nobody realize is that you they do your best teaching toward the end of your career. So I mean, really they do some of the best teaching when I decide, say, I they retire early, you know, even the head of the department surprised. I said, well, I'll come home because I don't spend almost 40 years of my life you know, now people constantly, and some of the same reason that we make, I go spend prime years, now people constantly, and some of the same condition that prevail now the country today. So I come back early for try for help out, and I day are one year, the second year I decide to make a help out now for Bay College, but I teach about one year a day, they are not really great for getting into the situation there really, because it's a microcosm of all the problem, you know, a kind of micro form of all the problem the road again at this country. It, it suffice for say, I no longer attached to Fobe College. I teach there for one year because I go on AYV TV with the Minister of Information at that time. We make a claim, which was a false claim, that the incumbent president and the father of democracy. So I proceed for debunk that claim there. Just a few days after that television en encounter, I uh, go on campus in Bay College for teaching class. The head of the department called me, say, no, 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 I can no longer teach because you get, you know, others from above say, I for stop for teach. So that, that was incredulous, you know, to say the least, because I feel say that they should change the student then. They're not interested in educating the student then because a lot of Ikishi and they go on that the university, then they produce students, they we don't know, they don't know, we don't know nothing because then they take money for grade, all kind of nonsense, then they go, you know, they, but that's beside the point. I get all the way them way at the time for contribute, we only do nothing, I did donate books them to libraries, to secondary schools, to, to primary schools and so forth. But again, I know I'm belabor the point. I know like for talk about myself. I know like for talk about waiting that they do, just enough for say that, you know, I've been getting an unblemished career at the University of Richmond. I teach there for 30 years and I'm very proud of the years they were put in. I just wish say I've been getting kind of opportunity for teach me on because I think say I will get more of an impact by teaching here, either and even if I teach now people country for a million years. But enough of that any question will address the issue at hand so in a nutshell me i don't come back home i've been here now for two two years or so i still they go back and forth but i'm pretty much rooted at home now thank you very much professor kande we appreciate that sir well um we just want to go we're taking into account the fact that i'm back home there is a short supply of electricity and that you get for use your generator. And normally this show lasts for two hours. So you are at liberty not to stay on for two hours. Just give it some indication uh, because any moment spent with us will be a very precious moment that will hopefully withstand the test of time. So we we'll appreciate every moment we spend with we. Uh, that said, what would they try to do? Now, for let you just shed some ideas on the present state of affairs or things in the country. Uh, we get two major political parties. They are at an impasse. Uh, we see from the last election till now, uh, one, one party decides not to go uh, to court Another, the same party decides not to go to parliament. And then you get all this instability in terms of 
and governance. So, and we know say you get some expertise in, in, in um, political science, I guess in government. So please, we just want to share you ideas, your thoughts, first as, a, as an intellectual, in terms of where do we go from here? What lies ahead for the country? How do we make things better? What do you foresee or what do you think that can be done that will put us in the trajectory of progress? So, and we know say, the country need good minds like you. And so we just want you con your own contribution, intellectual contribution in terms of the current impasse, the current state of affairs, the, the structure, the governmental structure of the country as it is, and then just share your view with, with Wisa. So let us turn them back over to you. you. You're free for start wherever you want to start. Uh, uh, thank you very much. I've not been there for the election. I left, but I come back immediately after the election. And I try to follow the election as closely as possible. In the past, I've been on write scholarly articles then on Salon election. But increasingly, you know, I became more and more disillusioned about the quality of election, the whole, the whole Na salon, because in any country where they try to be democratic, you want to let every election show some marked improvement in terms of quality, in terms of participation, in terms of confidence in the procedure as well as the outcome. Because let's face it, democracy is a very uncertain kind of uh, game. But one thing we for always be certain is the procedure. Then. Because once you adhere to the procedure then, and the election free and fair, elect them beat you. You're willing for go along with the outcome because you know, say, they not cheat you at all. The procedure being free and fair, not only the, the, the voting, but the counting, because it's not just about the voting, it's about the counting as well. So, the uncertainty in the outcome would have go win. You know, usually that is uncertain. And in a country like we own, Salon, we are a very polarized country. We're very divided politically. And most people then they vote their ethnicity. Given the polarized nature of we country, it's very difficult for let any political party or presidential candidate win outright you know, like the first round. So usually you, there's a tendency to have a second round, you know. And, and the, 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 the last person where he really had a landslide was Pakaba in the 2002 election, but that was a unique election. He had a peace dividend within the work for him. But in the latter case, in this last election, it's been quite clear. In fact, I go on TV, I call the election a choiceless election. Because for me, neither candidate, and this is not my own viewpoint, too, not to anybody's viewpoint, and I'm free for express my own viewpoint. I know we feel say either candidate really was worthy of the presidents, whether na Samura or whether na the incumbent. So I called it a choiceless election. But that don't mean say people they don't make their choice. They make their choice. We just not know who that they choose. Because then still no release the disaggregated result yet. They play all kind of game with the result. Apparently the voting was peaceful and everything, but the problem na the counting of the votes. How they tabulate all the then the vote then they without releasing the district by district votes, the disaggregated count has still not been released. So you never get confidence in the electoral process and the importance of having confidence in the electoral process cannot be overstated because the electoral mechanism mainly provide a safety valve for the political system when things go wrong you can throw the rascals out by voting them out but if you find out say that mechanism they not work anymore because they don't tamper with them you go vote they're not contam 
they are not going to threaten democracy. And now Africa, increasingly, we they find out that incumbent governments them, now then they threaten democracy. The opposition then said they pose their own threat. Sometimes levels of violence with and they come with and so forth. They're trying to destabilize and the, 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 the mission, uh, 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 uh of, of an opposition, not for destabilized country, now for provide a credible alternative to the incumbent step. So you get a situation in which you they get people then the kind of play games with the electoral mechanism. And that is very dangerous because if we look back in our salon history, we look at the one party state. What the one party state do is that it deny with people then the right for choose their own government through the, 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 uh, 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 through the ballot box. And what happened as a result? We had an armed insurgency in this country because there's no other peaceful way not been there for change the government. So you know for snuff that avenue day, that avenue day critical. Elect the opposition, they lost election. Let them convince it, they lost the election. No force and don't then truth. You use other mechanisms for try for derail, you know, the free and fair process where the election itself entails. So the threat, as I say, to democracy, they come from elections these days. Because where do they get in Africa lately are elections without democracy. Elections supposed for build democracy, supposed for be the starting point where you begin to democratize. Now the starting point that, but the election then for become better, then for become cleaner with time. And that is not happening in Sierra Leone. We election, they become a, 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 a lot more controversial. The election they become a lot more fraudulent, particularly the outcome. All the election they recently people and the contest them from the one way way what's her name again Christiana Top, you know the claim say he, he, he discount ballots from Thailand. There are people still griping, you know, belly aching, cry belly over that state today. Even the last 2012 election, there are those who said that be you. No, not be really agree with the outcome. But at the end of the day, he went along with it. But nothing, not so blatant as this last election. As somebody, we don't study election at this country. We don't write scholarly articles on election at this country. This last election result is very difficult for accept because they don't even release the full result. They don't even release the full result. But moving beyond that. Looking at the opposition, their own position on the election, then they within their right for decide whether they want go parliament or they no want go parliament for boycott. Now a, a protest, now a form of protest. We may agree or disagree with that form of protest, but it calls into question the election result. And we need people then for calling to question the election result. You just can't ride roughshod over the people because democracy means, say, you derive the power from the consent of the people. Not the way you go take an oath or wait and swear you in. No. You derive the power from the consent of the people. And right now we don't know. Because the outcome of the election, if they may go a runoff, maybe it will be a lot more clear. And who knows, the opposition may never have won. Because again, I don't ever see, you know, the opposition flag there as a credible alternative. But I don't even see the incumbent as a credible leader anyway. So, but my point is that if they be allowed the process for move on, so can get a runoff, then we're not going to face this predicament we'll face, you know, they like today. We're in a political crisis. We're not going to face this predicament we'll face today. In fact, before the election, one power, power operative, tell me, jokingly, of course, but Imina, even though not joking in the joke, he said, Prof, no worry. This election, yeah, we're already winner. We just they announced a figure over 55 percent would i at make it go police it's an so christian i talk we tell them so this thing was already cooked you know in terms of what the outcome will be and i make them able to release the result because the numbers don't add up and when the numbers don't add up that 
threatens democracy. So stolen elections do threaten democracy. Where you uh, uh, finger the constitution, that they threaten the, you know, democracy. Today, we they get cooled in our region, right? Now we sub region, again, at Guinea, and we think cause Guinea coup. There was a constitutional coup there, you know, by Conde, before you get this guy now, Mamadi, we move in, right? You get all that situation, then where you they get electoral coups, you know? So we're not for only to talk about, you know, uh, 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 military coups, but there are also constitutional coups and electoral coups that tend to threaten, you know, a derailment of democracy, threaten that oppose a direct threat to democracy. And the last thing we post in one, boys, then they come back now power in West Africa. And that's what we're seeing today. Precisely because the civilian they not govern govern right. And bad governance they threaten democracy, not only in Sierra Leone, but in much of the sub-region. So there is a clear intersection of democracy and governance. Democracy is supposed for improved governance, but that is not what is going on in Sierra Leone, because governance don't really uh, 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 take a backseat, you know, in terms of the calculus of most of the leaders. Then the main calculation are for survive, for you know, make sure so they win the election. So we are where we are today, I think, because the incumbents, they feel so they can get away with anything. They're so cocksure that the international community could just roll over and Sierra Leoneans, they not get any alternative. There have been high levels of intimidation, you know, in the country. And the opposition, not that vibrant either. Just boycotting is not enough. You got to do more than that. You see Sonko, they lead the charge. You know, now places like Dakar, now Senegal, you know, where, where, where Malik Sal, the one begin, you, you know, talk about the third time. You know, we own opposition, now, yeah, then seem for they take their lead from Adebayo, which is really sad. You know, it's like abdicating your role of opposition. But there, we need a very, very strong opposition. And the way you register yourself as a strong opposition, not only by boycotting parliament, which in principle, you know, may not be a bad idea as a reaction to an election that they consider to be stolen and that many fair-minded people consider to be, at least the outcome, consider the outcome to be fraudulent. So we are what we are because of our own making. My fear is that we not become a pariah state in that we're not able to attract foreign investors because nowadays, a lot of businesses, then they decamp from Salon, then they left Salon. Since I come, all kind of business, then they left Salon. Airlines, DHL, you name we're not even bought to. We, we, we soft drink they get at Salon, Guinea and Liberia. Then they go. So, I mean, it's like they're de industrialized in Sierra Leone. We're not even industrialized in any shape or form eh, to start with anyway. And even when it comes to you know, airline travel, you know, air travel. They lost most of the passenger then they say, you know, to Guinea. So there is something fundamentally wrong with governance in this country. We're not the only threat in democracy. It is threatening with security. It is threatening the livelihood of ordinary Sierra Leoneans. And I think we really need for begin to talk about even the kind of democracy we're suitable for a country. Because the liberal you know, kind of democracy where them folks here seem for being amored with, you know, seem for the work for anybody. You know, they work for them, it definitely not the work for the people. But a recent poll among Africans indicate that Africans still have confidence in democracy. The problem is democracy not a deliver. And if democracy not deliver, there will always go be a threat of an authoritarian reversal. That just get me started. I will respond to your individual questions. Thank you so much, Professor. Now, uh, let's go back to, you mentioned the one party state. Uh, Will you think that was the genesis of the, or of the problem over the sea politically, Nasralion today, because if you recall, 
when we first get to independence, we were supposed to be a democracy whereby there was going to be a governor general and we will have had a prime minister, just like how India then they, or like how Israel they. That was the independent con constitution where we go into independence, independence with. But uh, no sooner did one political party take over, there was this maneuvering, which led to what we call Republican constitution, which doesn't seem to have more meaning, much meaning to me, but it changed the, the structure of how we should have governed ourselves uh, when we get independence. So we will move from that type of uh, representative from the, from the monarchy, now England, from the Queen, to that of a presidential type of uh, constitution, where from then on, it doesn't seem like the country has, you know, has progressed ever since. Now, that's just me on short observation. I don't know what you think. What do you think, sir? Uh, yeah, I think it's, yes, I'll finish your thought, sir. No, I was going to say is to me, in my, in my humble opinion, that's how all the problem begin for start. Where we change that structure they were going to independence with, uh, and come up with this Republican constitution will provide, will produce a, a presidency as opposed to a prime ministership. And ever since we get this presidency, whereby no one was above the president or the prime minister, things they didn't seem to go in the right direction. That has been my observation. And uh, we just, I want to just get you in view as to whether the retrogression or the backwardness or uh, the lack of progress we would us see since independence, whether the change might have had something to do with it. Had we kept what we agree uh, for or on but at independence, I have the feeling maybe as Israel, as, as India, you know, as Canada, as Australia, as many other countries, who we'll probably will have, if we we'll stay in that trajectory day, we we'll probably will have been doing a whole lot better than when one man decided to become a strong man, became a president, and then subsequently declare one party. So I don't think we've ever uh, gotten back to the progressive type of um, governance that we will have embarked on at we at we state that cause. So I just want you to agree, disagree, or just tell give you give we you your perspective on that. Uh for the most part I think I agree with you with a heavy emphasis on the one party state, less so on republicanism, because after all we have to move away from you know the United Kingdom. We could not continue having the Queen or whoever, you know, the head of state of Sierra Leone. You know, I think we can compare ourselves to like the Caribbean, you know, the Commonwealth Caribbean. Most of them retain the parliamentary system. And some people you know, argue that for new emerging democracies, you know, a parliamentary system may be more workable than a presidential system because of the concentration of power in the executive president, we can always emerge from such changes. But I think the real critical change now in the one party state, and we'll have to remember when the one party state was introduced in Sierra Leone. They introduced the one party state after the 1977, you know, student uprising. Because it was not just a demonstration, it was an uprising. I was a sixth form student at the Albert Academy at that time. We mobilized and carry on waiting college students and we don't begin the weekend earlier and, and, and translate that into what became known as the no college, no school demonstration, which to this date is perhaps the most widespread demonstration ever in Sierra Leone. We did not succeed in trying to end 
you know, uh, the de facto one party state. In fact, it became a de jure one party state later on. Because we too be want to go and let resign, we want a more multi party system. Because that tending to IPC no more being in a parliament. Even though they're not being done declare one party state yet, they may not pretty much must muzzle the opposition, you know, through unopposed candidatures, you know, and so forth. So, uh, we, we, we'll be done already see the writing on the wall, you know, as far as, you know, APC was concerned and the one party state. So they came with the one party state in 1978 after the 77 student demonstration, you know, and which really was a sad outcome for students because not to so that would be want. We, we to be one a more democratic opening. Now that would be the type for forge, a democratic opening. So we get a more democratic system of government. Instead, we to end up with, we get a more authoritarian system because the labor union then betray the student them, you know, and some academic then decide for go join and run on a polls under the one party state. But what the one party state did again, it denied people then the right for change then government. So what now power government, one party state. Now be power government. You know, APC moved from uh, now or never, then the tweet the slogan to live forever. No party lives forever. No individual lives forever. So now be one party now be power government. Because I remember I mean I've been students now for be college then days then they the hold a referendum. And then this, then the students were so implacably opposed to the APC. We vote overwhelmingly against the one party, you know, uh, 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 constitution. But when they announced the result, they say 99.9% .9 of we vote in favor of the one party state. So now that the derailment begins. So the voice of the people no longer matter under the one party state. And you know, we're not being there for change that system there through the electoral box, although you can get a deathbed conversion on Momo in part toward the end where you say go brief for multi-party system. But most people are not been believing in the process. Then we feel say even if APC change to a multi-party system, then go tiff the election, you know, because they middle use for do that under the one party constitution. So the one party state, we went through a prolonged period of dictatorship. Now that so the seed for bad governance. It disconnects the state from the people. The state no longer reflect or embody or even seek for promote, you know, the interest or uh, cater to the aspirations of the people. So because now that's where you judge a progressive government, whether the government in policy rooted in the needs, in the interest, and the aspirations of ordinary Sierra Leoneans. But that has never been the case. It has, it was not the case under EBK. It is not the case now. Now I make the effect among themselves. We have two unreconstructed patronage parties that are holding our country back. If any one of them party have been sober, we country for don't go before. Lo, 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 lo. We all want beats chest for we country. But it look like say some of we go born, we die, we not ever get the opportunity for beat chest for we country. Be proud of we country in achievement because of the kind leadership they will keep for the producer in this country. Like somebody writes the other day, you know, I, I go lume to go, we get a workshop day on, on, on security, democracy and governance, you know, in, in, you, you know, you know, in West Africa. And somebody they asked me because I post a kind of postcard like picture of the Liberty Avenue, big, big, you know, roundabout, very beautiful. And somebody they asked me if Salon get any man made or human made, you know, artifact where you go even put in a postcard other than with natural environment and so forth. And nobody could say anything. Nobody could say anything. So we may live through our life registering no progress at all in our country. For just show say we know the progress. When we they grow up, we'll get portable drinking water. Now now well water people they rely on. We then dig well, then the whole opening ceremony, like na big deal, like na portable water. Yes, keke is 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 adaptable with people and they adapt they're very adaptable with their sense of humor and all of that 
you know so the keke you find a place for keke but it's like going backward not moving forward we're not having a mass transit system in Sierra Leone. you're having that in lagos you're having that in other cities you know you know in africa that's progress but we are trending backward not only on the socioeconomic indicators but also on the political governance indicators we are less inclusive today there is no no political the tolerance is very very low freedom of expression forget about academic freedom i was victimized myself but that's beside the point i can move on i don't need them you know I, don't, I, I came here on my own. I don't need them. You pay me a million dollars, I will not work for rogue politicians. It's not possible. Okay? So, but we, we, we need to get back to basic. You know, in terms of resolving the impasse, that's a political puzzle. The two parties, then, are they get for resolve that. We can come up with all kinds of academic possibilities or uh, scenarios or solutions, but none will work. Just like elections don't work. If those who are taking part in the elections, the participants are hell bent on skewing, you know, the procedure to favor them. So now that now we problem now this country. But I go back to your point. The one party state now you sow the seed of bad governance and corruption and anti democratic tendency then at this country because we've been the other pretty, you know good trajectory yes we can get jobson smith in interregnum and all last long then pull up and the one day we pull up the, the store shaka stevens we don't win the election in you know in 1967 and all of that but stevens kind of grew jittery and decided that he get for closing and, and try for control the army and try for shrink the political space so that the incumbency will be preserved so now that begin the problem at this country. Well, then it lead to war. Bad governance was what the one party state gave us. And that is what led to war, right? Without bad governance, that war not forever been at this country if we are governed properly or well. That war not forever, you know, you know, happen at this country. Okay, the war be. We get another opportunity. In comes in, uh, uh, in comes Kaba. Kaba, I was saying that the best leader would all get since the war, because he was exposed. He was not just about himself. He was about something larger than himself. You cannot say that about his successors, at least in my view. And Kaba begin build institutions. You remember when they Bobo then begin seeing Bobo Bele all kinds of things some of a henchman and while they move in on them he said no 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 when i left them before they did he better let them sing than they go na bush right so kaba was very very tolerant in fact tolerant to a fault he embarked on a policy of reconciliation you know try for bringing more more or can even extend appeasement to taylor and others that i thought was a wrong policy but he meant well for the country and started putting institutions in place. Some of us were very critical of his second term because he allowed the growth of a lot of IMP then at the country. And some of them, uh, uh, the new uh, government resurrect them, for instance, because then we don't go uh, recede into the political oblivion, they bring them back. Some don't serve as minister for almost 20 years at this country. We are not going to call him. You know, so that's where we got ourselves. After Kaba, the hope was that EBK will continue uh, trying to strengthen institutions. But after Kaba, they trained up for personalized power. So EBK tried for personalized power. And you had a spike in corruption, you know, on unexplainable wealth. If they if members of the political class can sit down and explain their wealth. They're not going to do that, obviously, because they're not going to be able to explain their wealth. All their wealth, it makes Salon a better place for all of us, especially for the average Sierra Leonean. The wealth where they don't siphon off. And you know what? It's like where this bunch come, they do their own, they left. Now, Fiti Fata. The next one we come, they say do their own. They no say, now both case. Nothing no get for happening. Because the one day where they cannot go, go after them, because then they come for do the same thing. So we keep doing the same thing. 
and corruption. Now the major primary incubator of poverty and misery. Now we consider today like today. Yes, we people and poor, but how will we lift them out of poverty if we members of a political class continue for scheme the lily and Nazi way they for build the hospital, provide clean drink in water, electricity and education for people then we don't have a chance because of the kind of leader that we will cost with. I sometimes talk about the party course, but it's not the party that is course, it's the leaders who are leading the parties. Well, really, if they put the country first, care about the country, because when the country go before, every Sahara Union will benefit. But if not just a few Sahara Union and they benefit, we can't see not ever go before. And at that they happy now the country they left today. Now a very few they benefit, now I make the country not they go before. We for flip the narrative, work toward making the country go before so that all men will benefit. So getting back to your point, I could not agree with you more that the Republican change to Republican constitution, but more particularly the change to a one party state sowed the seeds for bad governance, intolerance, and the division they will the see today in this country. All right, thank you, uh, Professor. Now, let me announce to the audience, um, please, the lines are open. I just want anybody who will get any comments. Uh, you can start sending in your ideas, comments, and uh, call-ins. So please, the lines are open. Feel free to call anytime. Um, now, Professor, we talk about, let me talk about in a democracy, the standard principle has always been the three divisions of government, the executive, the legislature, you know, and the judiciary. And some school of thought also think there could be a fourth arm of government, which is the, the press, because the press plays a very important role in advancing or in the advancement of democracy by, by allowing them to operate freely, thereby watching the rest of those in power and exposing them if there is any evidence of corruption. But let's we just take the standard three uh, divisions, judiciary, legislature, and parliament. Now, in Sierra Leone, we see, see the judiciary is extremely weak. In fact, power is heavily concentrated in the presidency. And again, I just want your own intellectual contribution because I've always contested certain practices in parliament. And I think we're still having difficulty in our country for deal with a constitutional government. We still they play this role of parliamentary. Uh, my understanding of the role of a constitution is that a constitution is supreme. That parliament cannot pass laws. We go abridge the constitution that parliament not get absolute power for just pass any law that contravene the constitution. That has always been my argument. But we get certain practices in Sierra Leone now, what we know, which to me is unfortunate because there are laws in the constitution prohibiting certain practices, yet there are also laws statutorily empowering the government for contravene the laws in the constitution. I always use one example, and I've always want somebody for enlighten me on that or disagree with me. We talk about the um, census. The constitution say once every 10 years. I think that is sacrosanct. What once, once you, the constitution says so, that's it. It's sacrosanct. Yet, there is a statute where we normally can refer to as act, Nasralion, allowing the president for discretionarily suggesting to the chief or the commission of election for conduct what you call 
uh, midterm elections. And I think that's a contradiction, but it's not much of a contradiction. I think there should have been a test case for find out if parliament in fact had the power to empower the president at, the, at any time in indiscretion can talk to the commissioner of election for conduct a midterm election. So these are some of the things. So my, I, I'm bringing this up only in terms of the judicial aspect of things. How strong do you think the judiciary is? And when some of these things arise, um, don't you think for a democracy also to work? Besides corruption itself per se, we have to understand or we have to have people who understand what their respective roles are. If you are in the judiciary, you for know the role where you play in terms of furthering democracy. If you're in parliament, you for know the role where you play. And then the executive always, by nature, by political nature, will always want to grab onto more power, more power, more power. But the legislature and the judiciary seem to be the ones entrusted with the primary responsibility for maintain balance, for prevent, for prevent excesses of the use of power. So I just want to make you elaborate on it, sir, in terms of besides corruption, are uh, there other flaws in the in system we will make, even if everybody turned out to be honest and not corrupt? If the judiciary is the, the way it is and parliament remains the way it is, do you think with democracy will prosper, will survive, will progress? This is not just, we just want your opinion on that. Uh, uh, without the rule of law, democracy will not get a chance. Uh, we judiciary in our salon are a bastion of corruption. I can understand why the opposition no one go to the law courts, you know, no one file a lawsuit, you know, in this election case, because they don't get confidence in the judiciary. Even in my own case, I think briefly about filing a lawsuit against the university because I rubbish the paper. They don't even send letter to me. They just send somebody for can tell me, say, I will stop teaching. What kind of crap is that? You know, what I look at the kind judiciary, I say, wait a minute, go waste me, tell me under. Because something similar be happened to me in the 1980s when I was a student. I come back in a salon for can do my PhD dissertation research. Now that's only I look about them and get them to discuss in a college. Then they have the all, then they have the whole self. So now the second term, this they don't rusticate me in a probate college. And the first term, I take them to court. Even though I mean, don't go back now, Wisconsin for continuing study, I take them to court and uh, uh, na, na be gavas best bets na be me lawyer. I win that case then abs absentia. They award me damages where I don't ever collect. We come in I don't ever get that in the guy was low over that. So the long and short of it is that people are not get confidence in the judiciary because the judiciary is intensely politicized. All positions then are this country. It's not just the judiciary, the educational institution, the civil service, all side, intensely politicized. So you don't get a situation where individual jurists they go rise above, you know, that politicization, they render judgments they will go be in the interest of the people as a whole. Just look what happened to that Samsumana case. There are all kinds of stories, background, you know, you know, stories as to what happened with those judges that led them to issue that kind of a judgment, which was a flagrant misreading of the Constitution. I'm not going to be a lawyer. I don't read that Constitution there many times. I'm not going to be a lawyer for understand, say, he became a get a rights day for fire a vice president. But as God will help us, he been the toy with the idea of third term boy back up. And I respect her that for that, that at least he back up because that would have posed another serious threat, you know, to you, you, you know to democracy. So the judiciary in an appendage of the executive. And if the elites they're not able to carry the case good, you can imagine the ordinary person. 
the whole judicial process just breaks them down. You know, you they get judged their way and say no, they offer judgment, even though now you they in the right until brown envelope cross hands. You know, so the judiciary is not exempt. In fact, they are so steeped in corruption, you know, now this country. No sector, no day, we exempt. We see university, then they trade grades for money, cash for grades. I was appalled. I was appalled. And I thought it was just a kind of, you know, fringe kind of phenomenon. No, it's widespread. It's widespread. So the corruption, if you get or begin really get at them, we cannot fight it from bottom up. We can only fight it from top down. Because now we lead that in the queue with people there. If we lead that they're not corrupt, we lie with people, then they fall in line. Saloma no lex sapiai. We see somebody, we straight forward. And at that, then they pray and look for. But right now, since nobody not seem for the attach much premium or value on that, everybody just go with the flow. Nobody not care. Now the leader then first, therefore show say they're ready for first corruption. And therefore leave, the, the yeah. therefore walk the talk, not to for just talk anti-corruption set up, anti-corruption commission, where just they go after low hanging fruits. No, you get for leave by example. You got for sure say the wealth where you accumulate, you can explain now. If you're able to explain you well, then obviously you get some in ways other than, you know, proper. Because most of we, the media and that thing, we really quick, 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 we'll get, we can explain that. We will say we work for 30 years. We will not even say better stuff. Well, that will really retirement. Now we will try to be really a bully. But if you just grab, now they, you know, how are you not a man? They make you minister. In less than almost here, you don't be almost to host. Come on now. Come on now. Let me say, you, you the people there, yeah. You they show them, say, that's the essence of power. Power not to enrich yourself. Power not to for, uh, cater to the people. Power not to for a power with people, provide for their needs, and try to make a difference in their life. Power is about making a difference in the lives of politicians, not in the lives of ordinary people. And at the end of the day, the reason why we are not able to uh, stabilize power and our country, we are not able to institutionalize power, is because the way we will organize power, the way we will exercise power, in order to work for the people. Where we will begin exercise power in a manner way responsive to the needs of the people, to their interest, to their aspiration, then power will be institutionalized. Because right now, whether you talk about the executive parliament, now the terrible institution that they not go ever pass law in order in their interest. So that they are not willing to pass fifty fifty thousand dollars waiting for them, each of one of them. Somebody tell me, say, we're well, better than the retirement package, then they get 50, 50,000 at the end of the, of, of the term in office. I'm like, wow. I know ever hear about that. But parliament, when it comes to corruption, they say they get written in a, 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 a parliamentary committee, where now they confirm appointments. There's all kind of stuff that goes on there about how those appointments are approved and what has to be done before they approve their appointment. Well, if you not begin to attack the issue, then they should say, you know, therefore, you know, grease the palm of any MP for be approved as a minister or as a director of some board or whatever it is. I think the demonstrative effect of fighting against corruption are important. If Salomon then get leader, where they no say not corrupt, this country they fall behind that leader. The Kaba, you can look around, me don't know about the corruption, you can get plenty of people in our government to corrupt anyway. But you know, go look around and say, Nakaba get this, Nakaba get that, or Nakaba get that, or whatever. But you look at, anyway, let me not even go there. All I have to say is that the judiciary is very, very corrupt. 
and there can be no democracy without the rule of law. Salon, now the most lawless country I don't ever, ever live, and not to the country this war left. I uh, usually, when they come back, even during the war, I used to visit. But we don't become progressively lawless. And the reason for that is that the ordinary Sierra Leonean, they take their cue from the leader. If our leaders are lawless, our people are going to be lawless. You can see how some of them, they drive that street. You can see how some of them, they drive the broke traffic or whatever, because then are some big I am people. Even though they say the president, they don't want them to say they're not for good traffic. Whether you're a deputy speaker, in, in, in the, in the habit always for good traffic. You know, so we have to lead by example. And we know they lead by example. And governance is getting worse. And the judiciary is part of that governance architecture. So I don't, I don't get much confidence in the judiciary, no more than I get confidence in the executive or in the legislature. You talk about the press. The press and civil society groups have been largely bought over. Civil society groups are more effective where they're autonomous of the government, where they're not linked to the government. But these days, they either take their orders from you know, donor agencies or NGOs, or they pretty much in lockstep with the government. You know, so they're not they provide an effective check at all. So the check no day, you know, they come from civil society, you know, they come from the judiciary. You take your case now, the judiciary come on, I mean, on this election, what are you gonna expect? And the reason why the judiciary is important, because Institution, they know they protect democracy on their own. It relies on human agency. Just look what's up in America. If the legal system not been stand up to Trump, if a TIF the election, I do want TIF the election, but he lost almost 60 lawsuits, and most of them are even judge their way appoints. Now the rules say the election, they not be free and fair. Contrary to waiting him in the claim. So if we, if America been get the can't judge, they will get a, 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 that would have been the real derailment of, of the democratic system there. So you need individuals that we can stand up. And sometimes these individuals will be even people the way they work with the president, look like way Mike Pence, right? Somebody we may not even care for. And most Salomon, they don't even know that I'm Mike Pence, but I've been Trump in vice president. Trump wants to make, he, he, you know, approve the electoral college vote. Let's send them back to the states for just dilly dally so that then, you know, they go throw all kind of monkey wrench into the process. Mike Pence not agree. Then Trump is supporter, they even threatening in life, they gala hang Mike Pence. So it takes individuals sometimes to stand up for fight for democracy and the rule of law. And we really not get the individuals. Everybody's about themselves, about feathering their own nest. It does not rise above that. And really, we problem at this country, talk and go, talk and come, we are screwed by our leaders. There's no other way to put it. Well, one other question where I get talking about the rule of law and uh, and the survival of democracy with it and the death of democracy without it, the rule of law. That leads me to another question as to whether we constitution need some urgent revisitation or revisit as to bringing it up to date or up to par in lockstep with what democratic principles are supposed to be. What in your opinion in terms of we, the uh, current constitution, particularly the 1991 constitution, that seems to be the main body of law uh, uh, in the country? Do we, or uh, 
does the country need an urgent relook of that constitution day? And if so, what areas you get problems with or which are your suggestions in terms of? Because uh, it's one thing to talk about the system is not working. But we also like to get ideas in terms of suggestions, what might work, even though one may not be able to have these things placed in in policy to make it work. But which in a UN suggestion, just stay with like the judiciary some of the flaws. And uh when you say the rule of law is very important, but what you can suggest in terms of the current structural setup will go lead to some improvement, like President Kababi, the bill institutions. Um, so it's almost like when President Kabal left, we took one step forward and three steps backward. So we're still two steps behind in terms of progress. So again, the question is, do we need to revisit the constitution, the 1991 constitution? And if so, or you can pick in terms of whether the parliamentary system, as you say, there is a lot uh, to talk about them in terms of their own contribution to the Malays with the country they suffer. And then the executive that has been uh, given so much power, which uh, also a contribution factor to the political malaise of the country they experience now. So I do know as a lawyer, the constitution should be the main anchor for progress. And one has to believe in it, and you for hold you out of office very seriously for move forward. So what is your opinion, sir, in terms of uh, the current state of the constitution in the country? Is it good enough to survive all these upheavals? Or should there be much more? And if so, how do we go about it? As you rightly say, the Constitution, where you swear by the Constitution, the idea is there, you go adhere to the Constitution. I think we problem, not to the Constitution as much, we problem our constitutionalism. I know lawyers get into the Constitution, I think he writes them singly and all of that. We, when they study politics, we can look more at the impact of the Constitution, whether the participants then they adhere to the spirit and the letter of the Constitution. So constitutionalism is very important. And that is not just about having a Constitution or a piece of paper. You know, it's about the Constitution imposing effective limits, not just formal limits, but effective limits on the power of the main players within the political system, whether or not the president, the chief justice, the speaker of parliament, you name it, the head of the uh, 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 civil service, that you adhere to the Constitution. So that's one of the problems EBK can get, we try for violate the constitution because that demonstrated a lack of constitutionalism which threatens governance because then you can change the constitution and run for a third term and that will amount to a constitutional coup you know and thank god he did not go down that road you know and our country is the better for that that he did not uh, although his uh, sacking of the vice president was an anti-constitutional act which again called into question the degree of constitutionalism you know now the country so i think we can tweak the 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 1991 constitution i'm not sure if you need a wholesale change of the constitution my main gripe these days now the electoral system where they adopt the dr system where they adopt i think it is anti-democratic especially given with context because it is separate the representative from the constituent. Now the representative, the MP, only beholding to the fat cats they are in party. Because at the party list, they determine who that they go parliament, not to who that the people they vote for.
because they vote for party now, they know they vote for individual candidates. If we be adopt like the system where Brazil gets, Brazil gets what they call a candidate list system where the voter not only vote for a party, but the party they get a list of candidates for every district or constituency, and the voter they indicate which candidates not their preference. So if the party win that district day, the, the, the candidates there with the highest preference, now then they get the seat. So the voter then still they determine who that they represent them. Not only like the system will get now, we're very anti-democratic. We already get an entrenched, embedded patronage party system. And what thing would they do now with this PR system, which is the, which is not an open list system, what do they do now is that we they entrench that power. So now the big week then are the party now they go they hand pick who that the representative then go they be. Now that kind of baffled me where this guy Mohamed Bangura show up in a parliament. But they did not vote for him. He only go parliament because he didn't have party list. Now the party they vote for, now APC they vote for, not to Mohamed Bangura they vote for. APC can remove him from their list. Either I don't understand how the PR system they work, or, or it just be up to no good anyway. And they try for getting pension, as some people they say, by having two terms in, you know, in, uh, 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 two terms in parliament. So the constitution and can tweak them. I think the idea of executive power, the kind of power, where they read into the constitution, that is the Supreme Court in the case of Samsumana versus uh, 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 EBK. I think that has to be revisited. I think that Supreme Court case they then get for re, they, they for reopener because it set a terrible precedent moving forward as far as the power of the president is concerned. Because now we not get future president we go grab say there's a king you get rid of the vice president like that because Anesco we don't set a precedent. So they go need for revisited we visit some uh, uh, elements of that as well. But again, my point is so not so, we probably not to so much the constitution. Because of that constitution, they will get away, kebab, and then a power. You know, no constitution, not perfect. And you get for the introduce amendments for try for adjust them for keep up with the times. One constitutional amendment where an office say uh, a day in the often has been allowing for diaspora voting. But it's not like the party they know like diaspora they go vote because they might bring in a different type of dynamic into the political system. But Guinea man then has along the votes in our election are Guinea. Professor, you if know, I may interrupt yeah. if I may interrupt you, sir, please let me just take a call. If please hold your thoughts, make I just take a call and make oh. I see what in this caller get in mind. Hello caller, what you know your name was I to call from? Yes, uh, good evening. This is Freddie Mustafa again from Leicester. Yeah, Mr. Uh, Mustafa, thanks for calling, sir. Thank you. I was just, I, I tell you, I thank you for bringing Professor Kandi today because uh, I've been like the last time I see him in EYP, even though <laughs> that was his last show. <laughs> anyway, you know, I just want to bring your attention to all the things about democracy when they talk about governance and about everything. We get for do about living standards. Mm -hmm. I think, say, we shall we miss the point about governance is where we not put the radar on living standards that what we do elections for. Because let me give you an instance in America or in Europe, any any government will come if you see people and they lose jobs or the I mean inflation or anything they go high where people and they struggle for poverty. That government is not fit for purpose. The next election, they, they will lose power. But it looks like, see, to we, that is not the full cause. All na rank or no more na in the for let people hold power. If they talk of uh, uh, one party state, well, would they talk about, even when we talk about this one party state, that in the world will they grow up, huh, man. Something we do, even though maybe now they, they not set the space for law, we can't do this out this way. But in the midday, we, we, we not get problem for move even from Musa Udi for kind of free tour. Like, it means when they talk to you, then they say kind of free tour, they ask people, which are they go to free tour? I don't, I don't need to go to free tour. I have everything that I need here. 
Ano si gudi? That time de aga tar road usay de water electric city. Ano ge fogo frito? But when the democracy can now the so called democracy we dey carry up. You not focus on within democracy there, but democracy now for the living standards of people. Either you maintain them or you improve them. All that talk talk about the laws about everything now for then you get there. So I think that they will miss them all. We we not glamour no more. We they say election people and dance, then they, they make lantern, then do this. They uh, they, they cook for them, they eat that time. They they forget about what you with what you with we look at the people in Africa. Uganda, Cameroon, they don't get leaders. They're not one leader they don't get for the past 40 years. They are far better than Sierra Leone. Mm -hmm. they, 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 are, they are still living in one party state, effectively. That one party state they live on. But these people are far better than us. Because the, the main focus we for don't get about the, the democracy or for elections, we now for make sure see people like get better living standards. We don't get attention about that. It just the go be it just the go be Look at who side the money the, the budget been there. The budget been there about eight hundred and eighty million dollars. Uh the way this government assume power. Now it did it under five hundred million dollars. That's not the budget they right now because if it, the exchange don't go down, so the money value don't go down. So now they would they, we just go be no more. With the, so what is the essence of having a democratic state? Whether that democratic state, not the, I mean, improve living standards, people when they go into poverty more. And we compare that to people that we say now one party state them, they are far better than us. Mm -hmm. Look at China. They 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 are one party state, they are they are better than the, the, a lot of democratic countries, you see. Now that's my one I want to uh, put uh, on, the, on the show tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you very Good much, night. Mr. Mustafa. So I will let the professor comment on that, respond to that. Well, thanks for calling. Professor, back to you, sir. Yeah, very good point, sir. In fact, much of the literature on democracy in Africa can emphasize the point that if democracy not deliver development, we likely for go back to revert to dictatorship. Because social provisioning, providing basic amenities, is critical to building support for democracy and for the state itself. If the state's not responsive to the needs of the people, it, it alienates them. They're not going to care for democracy. They're not care for governance. They'll be more lawless. You get for make with people and feel say they get a vested interest in what in the state they do, in the state in well-being, because the state they provide for them. The state they look out for their health care, for their education, they provide good roads, good hospitals, you know, you know, and so forth, electricity, infrastructure. You know, so you need that social provisioning. In fact, it's so critical. Now, there we they get an all wrong because we're so wedded to this neoliberalism where the IMF and the World Bank, they force power, where they call on we for kind of roll back the state because they say the state, they try for do too much and they end up for not do anything. And they invite more corruption. So they feel say, if you reduce the scope of the state, you go make them more effective. But that's not so that's the happy. You don't privatize. When I auction, you auction thing they off to crony, you know, investors. You know, so privatization not even makes sense in the absence of the rule of law. You need the rule of law before you can even begin to talk about privatization. But the idea of building support for democracy and the state it really rests on social provision. That is the state playing an activist role, ensuring that when people can get clean drinking water, because we're not going to, be able to dig water well, we're not going to, to provide portable water for reset, we we'll get electricity. No country you not know, develop without that energy. Say it today, 60 years counting after independence, we still not able to provide clean drinking water for the majority of the people. 
not to talk about electricity. As Mr. Mustafa pointed out, all Billy go up, things were much better. They were not great, but they were much better. Whether not transport system, we were more organized. The society was more lawful. There was more hope. As kids growing up, we were hopeful for a better tomorrow. Obviously, those hopes were dashed, causing some of us to live outside of the country for most of our life. You know, so yes, we get for go back. No government, and and the caller rightly point out that you have some governments that are not democratic. Rwanda is a case in point, but in Rwanda, most people go tell you say Rwanda may be one of the better governed states in Africa today. It's not democratic. The leader there can be ruthless. Kagame can be ruthless, but he is delivering for his people where it matters the most. He's lifting them out of poverty. He wants to make Rwanda the Singapore of Africa. We only that them, we don't even know it's in their aspiration. He became in the talk about Salon becoming a middle income country in 2035. Let me get some transformation conference on that. I mean, even give a talk on that in, in that conference day. And, you know, but again, we are so far away from that. Because we are trending backward, we're not trending forward. You know, I wish I can say we they trend forward because that's what I'm really looking for. That's what most Sahel unions want for say. Like I say earlier, on we all want beach chest for people, but I can only beat chest for the country where you no know, say the average sal salon person they get clean drinking water, get access to good medical care, good education. But the kind of education we will get in this country, not when they provide now. It's terrible. Even me, school work and Albert Academy. I'm not going to recommend that to anybody now. Because it has really, really fallen on bad times. That was one of the best schools in the country when I've been there. When I mean, I've mean been a high school student, you know. So all fast, all areas of society have been affected. And the, the, the social provisioning area, and they will really get for stand up. We need a government, not to for job build airports. Almost people they use the airport. Yes, I use the airport. We deserve a nice airport. And I give the government credit that they build an airport, even though the financing thing is quite something else, you know. But it's better than nothing than what we had there before. But rather than an airport, or rather than a new anti-corruption -cor building, that's our hill or whatever. Why don't you build a teaching hospital? Or even the old airport, then just left us to, to take a job mothball. We can get an aviation school under. Teach with new generation of pilots. Although we'll not get much of an aviation industry in the country anymore, but we'll be small, plain them in the go Kenema, Konobo, you name it. We had a domestic airline. So on all the metrics, then they would all really, you know, uh, 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 you, you know, uh, 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 retrogress, and it's very sad. But as the caller say, whether in a democratic government or non-democratic government, at the end of the day, it's the politics of the belly. The individuals, our people, are responsive, positively responsive to governments who make a difference in their lives and the way you make a difference in their life now for give them an opportunity for take care of themselves for lift themselves out of poverty make sure say they picking go school get the basics in life because they don't need handouts they just need an opportunity to make you know a better use of their life and see them picking become better uh, uh, Leave better futures than they may be able to live in the first place. So that's what it's all about, really. A building from the ground up. But if we not tackle corruption, the money no go day for provide some of these social amenities. So corruption is directly linked to Professor, our if, I may, if I may interrupt you again, sir, may I take another call just for see yes. what this caller has in mind? Hello, caller. What you know your name? Where you call from? Yeah, uh, yeah, Mr. Shiloh, yeah, this is Abdul Rekon. Hi, Abdul. How are you? 
Yeah, um, um, on a th on a thank you for the program. I got three questions um, for Professor. Um, can the first question can I get, yeah. uh, the, the que first question, now what do you make of the constitutional review committees the way we don't get in, for review the 1991 constitution since President Kaba in term up to now President B. You, you know things say from where they don't they set up this constitutional review, um, and the sincerity of purpose, nine lacking from the leaders mm -hmm. and so far, for let them go write mm -hmm. the constitution, where go serve the test of time and serve posterity. Then the second question, now what do you make of the president in posture at the United Nations um, concerning the row, diplomatic row where they go now, go on now between he and the United States um, concerning the election? Um, you think, say, the president from the, from the diplomatic, um, conciliatory, uh, magnanimous, or toned down in rhetoric, um, especially so we then they talk say we are sovereign state, but most of we know say um, we not get economic sovereignty and even the political sovereignty not there because most we elections them um, are the West the fundam either United States, UK, I, Irish, Ireland, UNDP not in the fund we election. You know if you to say for tone down in rhetoric. And the third question I get. Um, you, you don't think, say, the animosity and resentment where the deepening between um, the two leading political parties there, um, we don't span for over 60 years now. It starts from the 1960s between um, the two leaders, M. Shaka Steven then and Milton Magai, and the, that deep animosity they neither roll over up to this moment with the how, how you feel say the two party them were able for resolve this animosity and then we young ground between them and we picking them they not continue to forget this kind deep division with the country deep doing so I, I, I thank you thank you professor i turn that over to you again sir so i start go ahead I start with the last one, right? The one on animosity between the two political parties, whether that then go end. I think they are the best of enemies. They elect themselves. Because they know say we one day not power for a while. They say go come back. Because they mess up when they are in power. When they kind of governance, they govern pretty much the same way. There are maybe some differences on the margins, but they govern pretty much the same way. So they don't want a third party for emerge. Definitely, they will do everything for prevent a third party for emerge. We go split them both. So I think the animosity, the the artificial among the elites, you know, as deep seated among the elite, but it is very deep seated among the ordinary Sahara Union. Where they pull short for fets for the IRP, they pass out the IRP, they willing for fets for themselves. So that disconnect day, you know, it's like with democracy too, that the popular sector, they want democracy, but the elites, they don't care for democracy. They're just playing games. And that kind of relates to your first question about the constitution. You know, the, from Kabai term to now, it's like the incumbents then simply they use the whole process as a way of trying to come up with a constitution where go favor their own party interest you know their own interest and not really putting the interest of the country you know it before everything else you know as it should be so that's not a critical point where you link the animosity you know to the the lack of progress on constitutional review because the constitutional review really what you need is an independent body made up of individuals whose integrity are unassailable and you ask for getting kind of people and they are salon now we it, we get that kind of integrity but that ain't kind of people and they we need for write a constitution somebody where you know say not amenable to any party interest not to a party hack not to a partisan 
But usually they defend their young people there where they know say are partial to their interests, you know, for you know, constitutes then their review, you know, commission they are. So it, from the get go, you, you get problem with them. But on on BO in spots with the United States, uh, I think is making a huge mistake trying to pick a fight with Uncle Sam. Salona, small, small country. We can all have a sovereignty, all we want. But when we begin fet and kill we self now, and our international community we look up to for car rescue, we could not even solve our problem. We could not even resolve that problem. They and usher peace now, we can't Right? For almost a year, now the United Kingdom been the pay salary in this country. Yeah. We were a ward of the international community for the longest time. We are still a beggar nation. The last time the mayor been the even talk about getting one million dollar for plant stick na salon. Come on, we don't need donor money for plant stick. Certain thing and they will for they do for we say. But we're not they do. Have. Then where we mess up now that end of the beginning of our sovereignty. Sovereignty. Come on. Sovereignty is both a practical term as well as a juridical term. Yes. Because we're a member of the UN. We are a member of a community of nations. We are granted formal sovereignty. But we can't even exercise that sovereignty on the ground. We lack empirical sovereignty. Empirical statehood has to deal with effectiveness. Sovereign states are effective in terms of protecting their people, extracting resources from the environment, uh, regulating their society, ensuring law and order, and allocating resources adequately to their people. We get a state's way lacking in performing their function there. Then we talk about a sovereign state. This part with America is kind of unfortunate because we're going to be, you know, and of you say then they really think through the implications of waiting than they do. Because if you think through the implications of what you're doing, the one country, one of the last country you want to pick a fight with is the United States. We are not Nigeria. Nigeria is a large country. US policy to Nigeria, even if Tinubu's election was questionable, whatever it is, it's gonna be radically different from the approach to you know, Sierra Leone. Nigeria is not a ward of the international community the way we will have been a ward of the international community. So this sovereignty talk is just bogus. It's the, it's the refuge of the scoundrel. We don't get nothing else left for defending self not sovereignty than they talk about. No kind of fear in the internal business. So low if we want if election, low if election, we are sovereign state. That's all it's about. But how can another country tell you to intervene in your election? What does that say about your sovereignty? So the spot between Paupa and the United States is kind of unfortunate because now we go suffer. The ordinary people then go suffer if they begin blacklist we all over the world. Like I said, me fear Napole, the leadership now this country not end up for make we become a pariah state, an outcast state. We're not able to attract investors. In the end, we will just go toward China more. And wherever China get involved more, what you end up having is bad governance because they look the other way. They don't care about human rights. Sir. And they come in here, they go the hardball with people they left and right. And we, your leader, they don't care because if, if Kulala for them between we people them and the Chinese, guess who that and the side with? Not the Chinese. That's been all happen one time uh, African minerals, former African minerals, now Bumbuna. I've been going to do a town hall meeting day for the World Bank way back in 2013. The people then tell me, say, unless we go there one time where then we get some confusion, it threatened and said, any sonko sonko take place there. Then self go green sonko sonko, can me not be even waiting at sonko sonko. Now later on, then tell me, say, that confusion or, or whatever it is. So again, 
you go back to we leadership in terms of sincerity of purpose because that's what it has to start with as long as you have that sincerity of purpose you go ensure say whatever review commission is set up go produce a constitution that the people then will approve in a referendum and also you know go tamper with the constitution obviously so again uh on that issue i, I think I, I, I you know i'll just leave it at that so i'd rather not go any further thank you professor now you mentioned um you know calling that but that's what i call it lifestyle audit you gave example or you give example of uh say someone who everyone knew was not doing that well financially as soon as he becomes he or she becomes a minister as soon as they mm -hmm. elevate into that position they all of a sudden begin with uh ostentatious lifestyle that mm -hmm. uh makes anybody wonder how long has that person become a minister to live the lifestyle where they live and i think generally because sometimes we don't need a commission of inquiry for determine because there's a thing called common sense where god give we all uh we sometimes we get for apply so and we don't need uh evidence of proof but if someone who just in the in a year and a half can begin for when they appoint you as a minister you begin for build two three houses at the same time have about 10 vehicles partner you had none of which na government vehicle like just you you own personally start having your family to travel back and forth abroad i mean living well america you said no living the life and um, people have the right to question as to whether that new lifestyle day now as a result of ill-gotten wealth um so i just could never understand why in fact okay let me give an example and again this is just what i know and you can correct me yaya jame of gambia who was a tyrant a dictator and uh, an abuser of human rights but you give examples of countries then we get african countries they will get to uh almost a one party system but they're still progressive yeah yeah, yeah Jame, which we, we country so close to we both geographically and in terms of we uh historical lineage so the thing is the practice yeah, yeah Jame had that i understand to be the case was he not be encouraged corruption he himself was the only and the sole beneficiary of corruption. He was corrupt, everybody knew that, but he will not tolerate any of the minister or high level government officials then to be corrupt as far as I know. So sometimes in this area, we'll get some progressive African countries with one long-term leadership. One, because we're going to be resourceful. We're going to start thinking about new political theories. It may not be far-fetched to begin for uh, entertain the idea of, although one does not wish that, but if a leader is corrupt and progressive, as opposed to a leader who is corrupt and destructive and oppressive, I don't think it's too much price to pay, like Paul Gigami who may be one of the richest African leaders in, in, in Africa, but nobody will question the fact that he has done very well for him people then. It, well, Paul Kigami in what, or in, in financial what? I take the position that maybe in the interest of progress, that's not too much price to pay for in style of leadership. But I just like, like someone like you will get, because we get for start thinking outside the box. We get democracy as we 
in every time from the West, but we still need to be resourceful in terms of uh, how we practice democracy or how we introduce it to women people. So I just won't forget your own view. As we don't begin to see progressive dictators in Africa, and we also they see the oppressive ones, you know, like Guinea-Bissau, you know, and some other African countries, or leader, or like what we we'll get this recent uh, incident, I think, in Cameroon. So sometimes one begins to think, are we better off because military rule, I don't see any hope in military rule. I think maybe military leaders do come in, sometimes with the best of intentions, but once they begin to enjoy the sweets of office, like overnight, then turn on what purposely brought them there in the first place. So I do not trust a military government in any form. And sometimes when I listen to Dumbuya of Guinea, they talk about the changes when we bring in Guinea within a certain period of time. Change do take a long time. So I just wonder when some of the leaders there and kind of powered military leaders and begin talk, if they actually know what they're talking about. Because govern, governing or governance is not a child's play. It's a very serious challenge. So I always take the position that military governments are really not prepared. And both um, administratively and in terms of expectation, they really are not prepared for withstand the pressure that lies ahead. So I've been making all the statements here. I just really just want for no from you. Where do we go from here in terms of democracy, uh, oppressive governments, and the non-oppressive progressive leaders like uh, Kagame? How do we get all of these ideas and try for maybe expand or introduce or improve we own political system? Because we own democracy and uh, I don't know whether that's what we're supposed to call it. But before you answer, sir, before you comment, uh, let me just answer a call, then we'll go from there. Hello, caller, what is your name? Where are you the call from? Um, yeah, Mr. Yeah, Mr. Hello. Sorry, sorry, yes, sorry. Yes, sir. No, no, you're welcome. Go ahead. Yeah, I, yeah, I, get, one, I get one last question. I want professor, um, professor in, in view on the democratic institutions the way we get the anti-corruption commission, the auditor general, the electoral commissioner, commission and the political party registration commission, perhaps the um, the um, judicial, head of judiciary, the chief justice. Um, you know, feel say it, it is high time we embed the selection or appointment of them, heads of them, then democratic institutions, yeah. We make an open instead of um, the, we they give the president the total leeway for they appoint whoever you want appoint, especially so, what you think, say, whoever they have power, they go, if you go put, if they, they go put somebody way allied to the party, the person go green inside, the white outside. Or you go red inside, then you white outside. Then the, we are in there, they put the people and within the appoints are them democratic institutions in a tight corner. We they're not good, they're not they are not they are not they are not independent for make for take um dispassionate um um policies and we go benefit everybody instead and go uh, take decisions and we go benefit the post we appoint them. Instead of we get somebody we of high integrity and when we on blemish character, we we say Algerians, we go applaud, say yes, indeed. Then democratic institution, instead of then the work for the powers that be, then the work for the general good of every Sierra Union. Thank you, Professor. Back to you, sir. Yeah. So I start 
uh, with the caller uh, a question about uh, me take on the ACC. Ah, the ACC has been very disappointing. I think the best period for the ACC in a way, Tijan Kolbin did it. And he was pretty much run out of town because he won't go after EBK in some of the main mandate. Now, if the ACC serious profit corruption, then for come up with this standard, this rule regarding unexplained wealth, and apply unto the minister, them, the civil servants, them, plenty, them, Boku. In fact, they're not, not able to explain their wealth. We go pass mo legal muster. Let them explain their wealth. If they're not able to explain them, um, confiscate waiting, they're not able to explain how they get. Well, they will never do that. But unexplainable wealth should be the standard where ACC for apply, but they will not. Another thing where ACC can do, one of the most corrupt institutions then, now the law enforcement institution. Then. Because what in the happiness alone, the lawmakers and the law enforcers and those who administer the law, they are among the primary law breakers. The police corruption, Nagbangba Ode, empower ordinary citizens to help to bring an end to police corruption so then they pull me over three four them in the same week to the point i no longer pull over unless there's a checkpoint because all are for hide behind the uniform and the law to extort citizens so if the acc they see the police then they extort citizen bang they I go stop corruption at the courts. When, when the one they wait for the enforce the law, now then they are among the primary law breakers. So you, you can't do that. So the SEC is not a serious institution, as far as I'm concerned. Because then they pick and choose who that they go after. They will never go after their bosses, the one they will put them there. Because it is an intensely politicized institution. It is not autonomous of the executive at all. If it was autonomous, if it was effective, it should simply be folded into the judiciary. But because the judiciary is so terrible, I make you even need an ACC in the first place. Now, the Auditor General Office, because you're talking about waiting and call horizontal accountability mechanisms, waiting at them for help for consolidate democracy, and they are being destroyed now. So the ACC does not work that way as a horizontal accountability mechanism. Neither does the Auditor General Office anymore. Because the lady who been there, the Lara Tilopia, stay now. They're not resolve the issue yet. Because they want to audit the president and the first lady or whatever the case may be. But that is all about accountability. You cannot have democracy without accountability. So you attack the Auditor General, that's an attack on democracy. That's an attack on good governance. If you get the country at heart, we will talk about the sincerity of purpose. He became the all kind of problem with, 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 with Lara Taylor Pierce. But you know, ever Saka. And a deputy, Tamba Momo. Another professional guy working in that office. I had the, 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 the opportunity to meet him once, way back, a couple of years back in London. You know, get rid of them. Now, then, time people, the way they, they do their work without fear or favor, now then we need now this country. Those are our unsung heroes that we for elevate and celebrate. Instead, we send them packing. Because they want to do right by we people and do right by we country. No, they are not welcome. So it all goes back to the leadership. 
the political parties registration commission the electoral commissioner is a half is a political half he's a toady of the president so i won't even go there the most fraudulent election results nine it produced even christiana top uh, uh james jonah uh, 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 Walter Nicol, all the other electoral commissioner in the past, no ever come up with such rubbish. We even the international community, we quick for accept election result, the reluctant district. So because these accountability mechanisms, they not they work at all. They know they work and we lead as them feel say they know for be accountable. That is the problem. Then you may raise some issue then, uh, Mr. Shilon, I, I, I may have lost my thought on that. But I think you may raise one or two issues where maybe I should address. Oh, well, and basically, I was just trying to see if with respect to uh, I'll just turn with the idea of pro progressive dictatorship, yeah, some of yeah, which yeah. we now have in Africa, whether on balance it's better to have a, pro pro protect a progressive dictator than an oppressive dictator, such as like Guinea-Bissau, for example, the leadership there, where you get the oil money and everything, people are poor, the leader live all this wonderful life, and nobody can say anything, and he has been in power for a long time. So I was just, tr just trying to forget your view on just what are we going to do for ourselves, particularly with respect to Sierra Leone, uh, in terms of helping the standard of democracy. And uh, I've got many other questions about the role of foreign government and foreign agencies, but we don't get time for that. So I just want to forget your view on dictatorship or progressive dictatorship, as I will phrase it, and then oppressive dictatorship, you know, because the ones who don't seem to care about human rights, civil rights, is just by themselves. So how do you see which direction we're trending? And uh, what suggestion do you have? Well, let me just add to that, because Abdul, one of the caller, just called certain important offices, of which I have in the past spoken, but I have always maintained the police chief, the chief justice, the auditor general, the ECSL commissioner. If we want to give some kind of uh, credence to we uh, democracy, these people should be free from the influence of the executive branch, the chief justice, the police chief, the auditor general, and the ECSL commissioner. So I don't know what you think about that. So I just want to forget your opinion. Yeah, I think they should be insulated. There's too much political interference, you know, with their work. But on the issue of dictatorship and democracy and development, I think we get for bear in mind, say, now development supposed for secret democracy, not to democracy, they lead to development. You know, the idea is that as countries develop over a period of time, we they create the socioeconomic conditions that will go favor democracy later on. Now, the problem now as alone in much of Africa is that the type of democracy you would try for practice, now the liberal pluralist democracy will come from the West. But then West the Western transition to democracy different from we. The West, they moved to democracy during a period of rising prosperity, the Industrial Revolution, having a large middle class, a large working class, all them fundamentals then they not day. Economic development now lead to democracy in the West. In Africa, we all continue now, we poor. We they expect we for be democratic, even though we stuck in the midst of extreme poverty. So the idea for me is that 
the type of democracy we would all adopt, Naomi get issued. Because liberal democracy not to the only democracy. You look at some side in our Europe, they get what they call social democracy. Mm -hmm. Liberal democracy is difficult for lay work for we now, maybe in the future. But for we now, it's difficult because we people then still they define themselves in terms of communality, not in terms of individuality. And liberal democracy is all about the individual, the individual rights or the rights of the individual. We not get large middle class. The majority of people then poor, then are peasant living in the rural areas. We get to uplift them. We get to transform the social structure before we can expect for make that transition to liberal democracy. So waiting, I feel, say more appropriate, given we high poverty levels in this country, is a social democracy, because a social democracy they address the needs, the basic needs of the people there first. It is more egalitarian. It is more about social provision. They provide health care. Liberal democracy not care if you get health care. Social democracy go care if you get health care. So I think we for change the narrative, the focus a little bit, and social democracy is more about policy. It's not about you know, not having an election, you still get for gay election, whether or not liberal democracy or social democracy. But social democracy is democratic to the extent that policy is geared toward improving the lot of the average citizen. It's not just about rights, it's about obligation of the individual as well as the obligation of the state to citizens. So I think we need for kind of rethink the type of democracy where we want in Salon. When you become a social democracy, Sweden, Indian country, then they all are social democracy. Then get a, a, a cradle to grave type of social security for the citizens. Yes, the taxes are high, but most of the basic needs of the people are met. So you need that, but the kind of state that we also need in Salon uh, thinking along the lines we bring up about Rwanda and all that, is a developmental state. Uh, whether a developmental state possible in Africa is another thing altogether. But a developmental state, now the type of the model where many East Asian countries, they don't follow. Beginning with China, but also Singapore, now I popularized that model. We own model in Africa is more of a predatory model, another developmental model, where the state now an impediment to development in Africa, and not an agent of development. In a developmental state, the state's now agent of development. Now the state itself, now they take over, like what they go on China. Without an activist state, China no go dey outside they dey like today. Singapore no go dey outside they like today. But waiting East Asian country them we get where we lack a place like Salon, na a meritocratic civil service or bureaucracy because now they get for implement the reform. Then. We not get that now. We bureaucracy highly politicized. Some of the civil servants then the money we don't make. And we got one civil servant to the Oracle for Bay College. I won't name him. He's dead now. He died recently. He made a whole lot of money as a civil servant. And he openly bragged, seeming as if man would I ask Lego police. All kinds of those snipe building at Vito. Unaccountable. Cannot explain his wealth. But we don't begin to for the college. So there wasn't you at all. So again, getting back to the type of state, a developmental state caters to the needs of the people, the basic needs of the people. We not get that kind of state there in Africa. Mauritius maybe is the closest to that, you know, in terms of being a developer. Rwanda also may be inching toward that. But the thing with the developmental state, uh, coming back to your point, Mr. Shiron, is that it usually starts off by being authoritarian. 
as in Singapore. But Singapore is becoming more and more democratic. South Korea has become more and more democratic. But they all started off as being authoritarian because the thing about the developmental state is that you subordinate in every other interest, the elites, the masses, business class, ethnic groups, every other interest, you subordinate in it to the interest or the imperative of development. So the development imperative takes precedence over everything else. And for implement that type then kind of policy, then they, you need a visionary leader, the kind of which we've not produced in this part of West Africa anyway. So yes, I think we will rethink the type of democracy or the try for practice with the fundamentals, the requirements, socioeconomic for liberal democracy no exist we tr tradition inherited tradition was based more on consensus and not competition for political power with countries so polarized that for let we come together we can come together and mobilize around an ideology of development and subordinate our interest to the needs of development where the needs and requirements of development take precedence over all other interests in society but we're not even close to getting to that point i think we passed time thank you so, well thank you so much professor i was just going to say and we've gone beyond the time somewhat but it's been thrilling and enjoyable just listening to you and i think you've made us much wiser those of us who've been listening to you much wiser than we were when we started listening to you. At least I can speak for myself. So we don't learn a lot. And, and time flies very quickly when you're having fun. It's been fun just listening to you. So we greatly appreciate your presence. We hope you will come back. And I want to say on behalf of the OS and my co-host, Mr. Victor Mengert, uh, thank you so much. Uh, we cannot thank you enough. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I hope to see you back. Okay, and thanks for having me. You're quite welcome. Take care, sir. God bless you. All right. Bye -bye.